Well, good morning for all of you who are joining us. Welcome. I'm Dr. Margot Jacot. I'm the owner and director of the Juniper Center. And we're so excited to be doing this by webinar today. We do this every month. <clears throat> it's uh, the third Friday of the month. We always have a speaker. It's a time for networking. Today, the networking is going to be virtual. So hello to anybody that we have yet to meet. Um, I'm looking forward to being back in the office when we can all actually get together live. But this is great because typically we can only have about 30 to 35 people and we have 100 people on this webinar today. So that's very exciting. So very glad to see all of you here. So today I'm, um, you know, I'm always excited about, well, like, I'm usually really excited about our presenters, but this one I'm really, really excited about. This is Rhonda Kellaway. She is an LCSW, an SCP, and has an MBA, which smart going, by the way, that's pretty <laughs> handy. Uh, she's the owner and principal therapist of Life Care Wellness, a psychotherapy group practice of 19 therapists with specialties in trauma, addiction, and wellness. Life Care Wellness has offices in Glen Ellen, Chicago's Jefferson Park neighborhood, and Sycamore, Illinois. That's good to know. I didn't know you were in Sycamore. We're just as of January 1. <clears throat> good thinking. Much needed. Uh, Rhonda is a trauma specialist who focuses on developmental trauma and complex PTSD. She has advanced training in trauma therapies, including EMDR, somatic experiencing, and trauma touch skills. <clears throat> Rhonda currently serves as a lead assistant at Somatic Experiencing Trainings in the suburban Chicago area. She also assists SE faculty at trainings across the US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. In addition to being a somatic psychotherapist, Rhonda is a divorce and family mediator and popular speaker about mental health topics. Rhonda earned her MBA from Vanderbilt University, earned her MSW from Loyola University, Chicago. She worked with all ages at a Christian nonprofit community counseling agency prior to beginning private practice. Learning more about Rhonda and Life Care Wellness at life-care-wellness.com. And we'll give you that again so that if you decide at some point you want to connect with Rhonda, you can do that. Uh, I had the lovely experience of connecting with Rhonda at a training. I'm about midway through my three-year somatic experiencing training modules and Rhonda came to assist one day and I immediately knew she was brilliant and I wanted to connect with her more. So she is top notch. This is a really timely subject. Um, I'm sure that just like me, you've noticed that your clients are having a lot more somatic presentations because of all of the stress, the anxiety, the grief. So this is super perfect timing, even though it was planned long before this pandemic hit. So uh, we do have 100 people on the call today. Um, so Rhonda is really going to try to get to as many questions as possible. You can type in a question. Um, I'll have a text box open. Rhonda will have a text box open. But since there's 100 people, we may not get to all questions. We might have to prioritize questions. Um, there will be time for Q&A at the very end, but also after each exercise, Rhonda's planned three different exercises and after each exercise, she'll take a moment to try to answer some questions there as well. So hopefully we'll get in as many as we can. At the end, there is a poll and we ask that you please uh, click on that at the bottom of your screen and please answer that for us. That's really helpful for us. And if you're um, getting CEUs for today's event, um, the way you will get your CEU is that it's required that you have that poll completed and that you've paid for the CEU. And then um, Aline Quick, who I can't thank enough for all of her work to get this put together today, um, will be sending those out by email. Aline is the one who helped with all of the registration and getting this up and running. Um, we're going to lock the door essentially at 10 o'clock. So if you get popped out accidentally after 10 o'clock and we have to do that because this is a CEU event. So we have to make sure we have at least one solid hour for that CEU that people can't just hop on for the last half hour or 15 minutes and get their CEU. So we have to lock the door at 10 o'clock. So we're gonna do that. If you get popped out, we can't let you back in at that point, unfortunately. So try not to touch anything if you're leaving your screen. Um, but this recording, Rhonda's been very gracious to allow us to post it on our website. She'll have it on her website. 
so that you can go back in and view it at a later time. Um, okay, so that I think is it. Rhonda, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Again, thank you so much for doing this with us today. Oh, you're most welcome. So um, just to uh, kind of um, set the stage, um, and I know that you probably are all doing this as well, you know, working from your home, um, it's not the same as in your office where you have a little bit more control. Um, I do have a cat named Inky, and um, I think he's taking his morning nap right now, but there's a good chance that he's going to wander through. So I just want to kind of just prepare you for that if he does it. I, I can't really I put him in a room and close the door because he will howl. <laughs> he knows I'm out here. Um, you know, if there were a lot of people here, he would stay in the room, but it's just me and he knows that. So at any rate, I just wanted to kind of give you a heads up on that. Um, let's see. Uh, Ellie wants me or Margo to say uh, to all who have signed in uh, with your phone, we need you to email with your names so you can get credit for being here. Please email um, Eileen at info at thejunipercenter.com. So again, info at thejunipercenter.com. So if you're, if you're just uh, accessing this by phone, please do that. Um, okay, so um, uh, there was a question too about the slides that are available. I don't have them for download right now, but we could figure out how to do that at the end um, or, you know, after we, um, you know, put our heads together and figure out how to accomplish that. So I'm sorry we didn't think about that beforehand. But that's, that's life uh, as we know it right now. So I hope you are all well and um, I'm grateful that hopefully nobody had to go anywhere this morning with the snow. You can just kind of enjoy the beauty of it and um, enjoy uh, just maybe being in your home this morning. Um, so let's let's get started. Um, now, as Margo was saying, you know, the, the SE training is actually a three-year training. It's, um, uh, let's see, six, eight modules over the course of three years. Um, and so I'm going to try to just represent it in an hour. Um, so know that there is a lot more, but at least uh, what I'm trying to get at is, is the theory, you know, underneath somatic experiencing. Uh, I, you're going to be able to walk away with uh, a few tools that you could use even today uh, with some clients. Um, obviously, you are not going to be a somatic experiencing practitioner at that point, but they are useful tools, um, and I do hope that you experiment with them. So, um, a sm pardon me, somatic experiencing is a mind-body approach to healing trauma, um, and I think you may be aware that this is sort of the, the kind of the third wave that things, uh, you know, within our field are, are going more and more in a somatic direction as uh, research comes out that, that, you know, really supports this idea that it's the body and mind, particularly when it comes to trauma, uh, but with, with other, um, well, what, what I used to call pathology, but, but what I think of is, as nervous system presentations now. So, um, so I hope you enjoy the presentation and uh, we'll get right to it here. Um, okay. I love this quote by Dan Siegel. If you want to do something really valuable with your life, treat unresolved trauma. And uh, I know, um, you know, how I got into the trauma field just really briefly. Uh, I was, uh, I think actually in my second field placement or sh just out of it and working at Warrenville Youth and Family Services. Every month we had a um, kind of a, a training and there would be a presentation on a topic. Well, one month there was a presentation on um, Judith Herman's book, Trauma and Recovery. And as I sat there listening to the presentation, it occurred to me, or at least this is how I took it in, that, you know, under almost everything in the psychological realm, it can kind of be traced to trauma. Not everything, but just, <laughs> just about everything. Yes, there are, you know, genetic things, uh, et cetera, but, but even those, you know, how did they get formed? So often trauma was at the root of it. And what occurred to me as I was listening to that presentation was I wanted to work with, with what was at the root 
as opposed to kind of working at the surface. So that's how I conceive of, of trauma, kind of being at the root of many things. I think the uh, ACEs study, if you're familiar with that, the Advanced Childhood Experiences Study, is, is really um, more proof that trauma so often underlies what we see in terms of um, mental health issues. Um, so we're going to start with an exercise almost right away here. And um, again, you can use these exercises with uh, clients, with yourself. I really encourage you to use these exercises for yourself as you navigate your way through sheltering at home and um, this, this unprecedented time that we're all dealing with. Um, SE is very much about embodiment. Uh, it is not the only approach to uh, embodiment. There's a lot of approaches out there. In fact, Peter Levine, the developer of SE, actually borrows from many, many other sources. But um, in these exercises, I hope that you uh, yourself will feel the benefit of that. Um, as Margot mentioned earlier, we're going to be taking questions after uh, each of these exercises. Uh, and it's not necessarily about the exercise. It can be about anything. Um, but uh, I, I invite you to just sort of set that aside to the best of your ability and to really just be present with the exercise itself, okay? So um, I invite you um, to, in this moment, to use your senses and just look around the space that you're in, letting your eyes just gravitate to whatever they wanna gravitate to or your ears, but using your five senses Identify three things that you're drawn to in your environment. So just looking around, it could be what you're sitting on. It could be perhaps what you're seeing out a window or maybe some art, might be a pet. Just identify three things you're drawn to in your environment. So now sensing internally, identify one sensation you're aware of from within your body. And it may be as you have these three things in your awareness, or just stopping and just sort of checking in, in internally and noticing a sensation you're aware of. And sensations could be things like heaviness or lightness. Uh, it might be openness, spaciousness, could be a twinge or a, a pain. But just notice what, what you're experiencing and identify one sensation you're aware of from within your body. And then when you're ready, again, using your senses, just again, come out into the environment and again, identify three things you're drawn to in your environment. Could be the same three, might be different, but just noticing. And now, notice what's happening for yourself right now. How do you feel overall right now in this moment? You might be curious, is it exactly the same as you were feeling before we started the exercise? Or does it feel slightly different? There's no right or wrong, we're just noticing. So that's the end of the first exercise. Very simple, straightforward, kind of noticing, or in SE terms, you would call it orienting to your environment, and then noticing the felt sense of that experience. So with that, I'm gonna just pause. And if anyone would like to share, you know, what they noticed, or if you have a question, 
Um, I'm going to uh, go ahead and put that into the Q&A box. You can find that at the bottom of your screen. Just click on Q&A, and we'll see if, if there are any observations or uh, anything else that's coming up. Everybody must be feeling really good. <laughs> Nothing's coming up right now. We'll go ahead and just continue on and know that there'll be opportunities for more questions, et cetera, later. So if we break it down, that exercise, orientation kind of falls into two categories. There's the exteroception, so that's that orientation out into the environment. And that's where we receive direct information from the external environment. Your five senses are, are mostly what informs that, although it does go beyond it. So your, your sight, your hearing, smell, taste, and touch, all those things that you learned way back in grade school about uh, your five senses. But that felt sense is a person's awareness of their internal state. So this is, uh, your ability to, to notice all sorts of information from your body, the respiration rate, heart rate, your body temperature, sense of balance, whether you're hungry or thirsty, um, you know, whether you need to use the restroom, um, emotions, pleasure and pain. I would go beyond that and say sensation as a whole, although particularly with emotions and with pain, with all of these, you know, your system is giving you different constellations of sensation that tell you uh, information about each of those things that are listed. So SE very much utilizes this exteroception and interoception um, to uh, help achieve our purposes, which are um, helping to navigate um, trauma, um, to come back to wholeness and goodness, to help with uh, nervous system regulation. Um, so this is kind of the, the little, uh, not tagline, but the definition of what SE is. It's a, uh, considered to be a potent psychobiological method for resolving trauma sy symptoms and relieving chronic stress. Um, SE is designed to resolve traumatic stress and increase the capacity to negotiate stress and trauma. Um, and in the day and age that we're living in, I think that's a really important aspect of it. Uh, Peter Levine is the developer of somatic experiencing. Again, it's a psychobiological uh, approach, and this treatment modality offers a comprehensive understanding of traumatic stress and human stress behavior, um, a framework to assess where a person is stuck in fight, flight, and or freeze responses, and then the clinical tools to resolve those fixated states and to transform patterns um, you know, that are keeping the person stuck and then overall strengthening the resiliency uh, of, of the system. So Peter Levine is an author. These are probably three of his more famous books. There's additional books besides these three. Um, he's devoted 40 years of his life to studying and researching the physiology of stress. So that's, again, fight, flight, freeze responses. Um, he asks the burning question, you know, why is it that animals in the wild who are repeatedly exposed to life-threatening events, why don't they seem to develop the symptoms of PTSD like human beings do? It's kind of a curious question. So he worked with ethologists who are um, people that study animal behavior, particularly animals in the wild, and he discovered that all animals, including human beings, have a natural immunity to the long-term debilitating effects of trauma. Um, it's, it's sort of baked in the cake, as it were. So SE fundamentally is informed by what he noticed and, and working with ethologists, what they have discovered about how animals in the wild uh, respond to threat. So when overwhelmed or threatened, these animals go through predictable stages of responding to danger via fight, flight, and freeze. Um, so in order to optimize chances for survival, the body you know, activates implicit hardwired survival sequences, and then 
it mobilizes high levels of energy to defend itself. And in doing so, it shuts down unnecessary bodily functions. I think in my work with, uh, and I specialize working with developmental trauma, this has been so important for me to understand this automatic process that happens within the system. Um, you know, what happens as a, a being is exposed to threat. After the threat is passed, uh, again, the research indicated that animals return to normal functioning by discharging that survival energy, you know, the extra energy that's no longer needed for fight or flight, and by integrating the excess activated energy. So this is the underpinning of uh, the theory of, of SE and, and the therapy of SE. So um, I would show this polar bear video, except I only have an hour. <laughs> so I'm not gonna be showing uh, two videos today, one being the polar bear, but I invite you to go online, to go to YouTube. You can um, just Google in YouTube, um, you know, polar bear somatic experiencing. You'll probably find this video. Uh, long story show, short, it shows a polar bear kind of uh, being monitored uh, from a helicopter by some, um, you know, ethologist uh, studying animal behavior. Um, and it shows the, the bear being tranquilized with a tranquilizer dart. Then skipping ahead, they're on the ground with the polar bear who is tranquilized. And what you start to see, although they don't, the, the, the two people in the video don't talk about this, but from an SE perspective, what you see is the polar bear, even as it's starting to sort of come back, you see its feet, its paws start moving again, and its breath changes. So what that bear is trying to do is to complete that flight response that got interrupted by the tranquilizer dart. And so that completion of defensive responses is very uh, much a part of somatic experiencing. Um, you may be familiar with Bessel van der Kolk, who is a big uh, man, a big name in uh, the research concerning trauma. And he introduced to the mainstream um, field of, of psychology that talk therapy alone is insufficient for trauma and stress-related disorders. He was one of the first that really um, developed the research, uh, brain imaging research uh, mostly, that really showed that um, talk therapy without this somatic basis was probably gonna be insufficient. I can talk more about that later if there are questions. Um, so what we know is unresolved trauma creates dysregulation within the nervous system. And it has effects that people often don't realize are connected to their past traumatic experiences. And uh, these, uh, this dysregulation affects the subcortical regions of the brain that are not easily accessed by talk. So, you know, the, the brain stem, the limbic center, et cetera, um, that's really where the dysregulation from trauma is, is um, affecting or it's the areas that this dysregulation affects the most. So you know, the triune brain model is a simplistic model, um, and, but, but it's useful in, in some respects. That blue part, the thinking part uh, of the, um, the brain has to do with cognition, language, speech, uh, social and regulatory centers. Uh, if you're familiar with Dan Siegel's hand model, you know, so again, this is, this is the outside of the brain. Um, that green area or the limbic um, center has to do with emotions, uh, memory, and uh, the amygdala's alarm center of the brain. And then the brain stem has more to do with sensing. So that's where that instinctual survival um, apparatus really is, is uh, housed. The fight, flight, freeze, and then the basic primary um, uh, aspects of life, digestion, reproduction, circulation, breathing, sleeping, uh, movement, et cetera. Oops, I should have been doing these as I went. So um, when we think about this, uh, talk therapy is going to be mostly focused on that thinking, that blue area. That's, that's the part of the brain that talk therapy largely addresses. 
maybe a little bit into the green, the feeling part of the brain, you know, as we talk about memory, et cetera. Um, somatic experiencing and other uh, more body-oriented therapies are going to instead uh, be primarily focusing on working with that limbic center, the green part, and the red part, which is the brain stem. So the reptilian brain and the mammalian brain, as it's sometimes called. Okay, oopsie. Sorry. There we are. So SC and the subcortical brain. It's important to realize, at least Peter Levine pointed out, that trauma is in the nervous system, not in the event. Traditional therapies approach trauma resolution via those cortical brain systems, you know, language, conscious thought, explicit memory. Again, that sort of cortex area of the brain. But somatic experiencing is going to, again, recruit and, and work with the subcortical brain systems, um, you know, body sensations, unconscious dynamics, implicit memory. Um, so what the body wants to do to support safety and re-regulation in the nervous system. So again, to kind of contrast somatic therapies versus cognitive. And again, it's not one or the other. It's just sometimes certain therapies are, are more suited uh, to, um, to situations, to, to uh, clients, um, where they are and, and their own nervous system. Uh, but particularly for those with trauma, um, we'll just sort of compare and contrast here. So cognitive uh, approaches to trauma therapy focus on how thoughts are influencing emotions and behaviors versus somatic approaches, which focus on how the body influences those thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. So kind of a top-down versus bottom-up approach. Uh, cognitive approaches would be focused on helping to identify the distorted cognitive beliefs and maladaptive behaviors that the client has versus somatic approaches, would, which are focused more on helping people become aware of body sensations and procedural memories. Cognitive approaches target the reduction of, of symptoms. Somatic approaches are gonna target the underlying dysregulation in the nervous system that's causing and maintaining these symptoms. Cognitive approaches help create more adaptive self-beliefs and behaviors. Somatic approaches help create a greater control over the debilitating symptoms and unconscious dynamics. And so in sum, Cognitive approaches are going to rely more on insight and behavioral change versus somatic approaches, which rely on awareness and physiological res, uh, regulation. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier on, you know, there's this next wave of evidence-based approaches, and I really need to update this slide because there's more and more research uh, on these somatic approaches directly, but um, we're starting to get the sense from the research that CBT is wonderful with reducing symptoms on a short-term basis, but mounting research suggests that long-term there are higher relapse rates and clinical ineffectiveness for some disorders. So somatic approaches, you know, the evidence is suggesting that, um, you know, there's, there's promising, um, uh, the research ind indicates that these therapies are more promising in terms of their long-term effectiveness as well as short-term. Um, many of you do EMDR um, and uh, or are aware of EMDR, and uh, I think the EMDR community was was very fortunate to have Francine Shapiro develop it. She was at the Mental Research Institute in Palo Alto, California, when she developed EMDR, and of course they are set up to do therapy from the or not therapy but research on therapy. There. Are, if you, we go way to the bottom, there are a number of research, research studies having to do with somatic experiencing that have been completed. And again, I need to update the slide because again, it's showing uh, effectiveness. Um, so uh, EMDR has a ton of research behind it. Um, this is just kind of, again, uh, the next wave. Ah, another grounding exercise, well-timed, I think, um, or another exercise here. So I invite you to, again, just take a moment to notice your overall experience. Feel your feet on the floor and move and shift until you feel the contact of your feet on the floor. 
Feel your back and your bottom. Feel the chair supporting you. Continue to adjust to find that comfort spot for yourself. And again, noticing what you feel overall. By just stopping for a moment and noticing your embodied experience. I find that my eyes are drawn to the outside. Still uh, snowing out here in the western suburbs. So I know that um, Margo was answering a question um, when we sort of, or when I came back into the call. Margo, do you want to um, kind of deal with that question now or should we just move ahead? Um, well, do you feel up to taking a quick question now? I can take a quick question. Okay. I think it was from Barbara Schwartz. She was asking about how does this work in a dysregulated nervous system, which I think is kind of, you know, perhaps just the, the broader mm -hmm. question that you're answering right now. So Correct. Uh, if there's yeah. more specifics, but, but mm -hmm. I think that's kind of what you're covering. But Rhonda, however you'd like to. Well, it's, it's actually a good segue to, to this next section. Um, so Barbara, let's see if I answer the question, you know, in the course of the next several slides. Um, because, you know, from a somatic experiencing approach, we are understanding this, the nervous system in a new way, a different way. So we understand that the, the autonomic nervous system is, is really about kind of regulating our system, regulating our body. And um, you're probably remembering from graduate school that the autonomic nervous system has these two parts for some simplicity's sake. And I'll get into Stephen Porges maybe in a little while. But there's the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So the sympathetic is kind of the, the gas, so to speak, if we're using a car analogy. It, it makes things go. And, and in some respects, a car is a great analogy because when you turn on your car, the car is idling. In other words, it's always going once it's on. Our systems are the same way. The sympathetic nervous system is always going. The parasympathetic acts as the brake on the sympathetic. So if you are in a pretty calm place, that parasympathetic is more dominant at that point, keeping you know, more of the brake on the sympathetic. If you are in a situation where you're having to react to something, that, that parasympathetic break, you know, eases and the sympathetic comes on, more online. Um, there's more power to respond to what, what's happening. So during our day, there are going to be these cycles of activation in the system and deactivation. That's the way it's designed to over and over activate, deactivate, activate, deactivate, activate, deactivate. And we see that, that this up and down action, that that's normal. That's the way the system is supposed to operate. There's a charge, discharge, charge, discharge. Now, if things are working well, you know, this, this, this flow is happening um, and it's unimpeded and it operates within a certain range of resiliency. Again, that's kind of a Dan Siegel concept, that window of tolerance or range of resiliency that we can have this, this up and down, um, back and forth activation and deactivation cycles within a certain range so that you know, my body is responding appropriately to whatever is being presented to it. I can, I can work, I can have excitement, you know, I can, well, I'm not gonna necessarily run. Um, I, I might walk quickly. Um, those are all sympathetic in nature. And parasympathetic would be the rest and digest, the sleeping, etc. So all of that occurs within a normal range when the autonomic uh, nervous system is functioning well. So SE is, is largely about supporting what you just saw. We want to support the system in this functioning um, because in many respects, you know, the system is designed to operate well. 
So we want to support and keep our focus on where it is doing well, where there is coherence in the system, where um, it is operating well within a, a, a wide range of resiliency. Oops, I talked about that. Okay, and I'm going to be coming back to that idea of the range of resiliency in a little while. But know that the autonom autonomic nerve branch of the nervous system really uh, is about employing four important survival functions in emergencies, that is. So in an emergency, our go-to as mammals, as human beings, should be social engagement. That should be our first place to go. And you can really see this with kids. Where does a little kid go when they are scared, when they're feeling a sense of threat? Ideally, it's to mom or dad or the caregiver. So there's that social engagement. That's supposed to be our first go-to. But, you know, sometimes that's not appropriate or it's not available. So our systems are also designed to fight or to flee. Again, these are hardwired into our autonomic uh, nervous system. And then sometimes when none of the three, the three above are, are possible, a freeze response is an important survival strategy, a, a function in that emergency moment. So um, again, I'm not gonna show this because of our limits of time, but this is a, a wonderful video. It's about 30 minutes long that I really recommend you, you check out on YouTube. So if, again, if you just put into YouTube, um, Ray, Iraq, Vet, Peter Levine, or somatic experiencing, you're gonna find it. Um, this shows Peter Levine actually working with Ray, this veteran, who after one of his deployments, um, though, well, after a deployment in which the vehicle he was riding in kind of got blown up by a roadside bomb. Um, and ever since that experience, I forget exactly when it started after that, he developed these series of, 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 of kind of, you know, tick movements. And so it shows Peter Levine working with Ray on that movement because <clears throat> uh, one of the um, tools that we use most often with trauma in SE is we slow things down. And so this video shows Peter slowing down Ray, slowing down this movement and noticing the sequence of what's happening right before and after the movement. And what you start to see is this movement has everything to do with the threat response because once it's slowed down, you see um, that, that the movement isn't really a tick, it's like that. It's Ray's body responding to this um, roadside bomb. The, the system, the body is trying to get away from the blast. It was interrupted because I think he lost consciousness. And so just like that polar bear that was out for a while and then you know, started moving again to complete the, um, the flight response, Ray's body was doing the same. And that tick, that recurrent tick, was simply his body trying to complete a flight response. So it's a fascinating video. I really encourage you to, um, to go to YouTube and check it out. So um, in terms of SE, a few of the basic skills that we've talked about in an interrupted fashion, but talked about so far, um, are orientation. Again, remember that first, uh, first little um, exercise where we noticed the environment because that uh, orientation is really the first part of a, um, a threat response. It's really even just prior to the, the defensive response, it's orienting and exploring the environment. So if you think of a deer, you know, in the meadow, for example, um, it's, it's just munching away, you know, everything is wonderful until it hears a sound. And then suddenly there's the startle and arrest and its eyes, go wide and then narrow in on where that threat sound was coming from. Its system determines then, is this a threat or not? If it's not a threat, what does the deer do? 
it goes back to grazing. The orientation has done its job. If it is a threat, that deer is gonna take off running. So again, that orientation is that first part of that flight, or pardon me, of the um, defensive response. So we worked a little bit with orientation. We worked with the felt sense, because just like that deer in the meadow, you can respond to that felt sense. And in a way, we do this all the time. Um, think about times when you had a feeling that something was wrong. Now, that might have been something within your own body. You felt like you were getting sick. Or it might have been, you know, coming into a room and it's like, wait a minute, something's not right with this picture. So that felt sense is, is something that we use all the time. In SE, we make it much, much more, um, uh, how do I say this, overt, <laughs> or at least the awareness of it overt as opposed to something that goes under the radar most of the time. We also work, or work with tracking, so noticing what's happening from one moment to the next. Um, the SE therapist is tracking the, the body of the client, noticing things like heart rate, uh, noticing breath patterns, noticing differences in um, uh, changes in the skin tone, for example, from moment to moment, noticing movement that the therapist is tracking, and we encourage our clients to track their systems as well for what, what their body is trying to tell them. Because often, just like that deer in the meadow, our body tells us what we need to be doing, but it's in some respects human nature to frequently override what the body is saying. Another skill that we haven't kind of gone to yet is resourcing. Um, so what are those things in our environment, kind of external, that are a resource to us? What are things that are internal? Resourcing is something that we're actually all doing right now. Um, you know, to, to kind of deal with this coronavirus, to deal with being in place, sheltering in place, calling on resources, be it external or internal, to help us get through this. As I mentioned, the felt sense is a huge piece of SE. We help clients get to know what these sensations are in their body. And the reason that we, um, we focus on this is because the felt sense is actually the language of the nervous system. Remember again, the triune brain, you know, we can have cognitive thoughts about our situation, but what our body is trying to tell us about a situation or a memory or something is communicated through the felt sense. So in SE, you know, an SE therapist is going to be really working with the client to develop this language because in our society, we don't necessarily um, talk about this a lot. Some clients are totally cut off from their felt sense. So in SE, we work to restore that connection with the felt sense because uh, the body is the roadmap in terms of what needs to happen to uh, navigate, to renegotiate the trauma, to respond to what's happening in the here and now. So let's do a felt sense exercise. So take a moment and think of an experience or a person that makes you really happy something or someone that brings a smile to your face. It can be something or someone currently in your life, or it can be someone or something from your past. It might even be someone or, or something that, that you just, you know, uh, make up. But something that makes you happy, brings that smile. Now, as you have that resource, in your mind's eye, you're thinking of them, feeling the smile, go ahead and identify one sensation internally. And then as you notice that sensation, you know, if we could see that sensation, how big would it be? What, what's the size? Would it have a shape? Would it have maybe a texture? or a density? Would it have a movement that seems to be in it or around it? 
maybe even a color that goes with it. Just notice what comes to your mind. And as you become aware of those qualities inside, now notice what's happening overall. What do you notice as you scan your body in this moment? Continuing to have that resource in your mind's eye, noticing that sensation and what that sensation is like for you. Um, before we stop and take some questions, I'm just going to you know, talk about resources. And again, this can be something super helpful for working with your clients right now. You know, generally speaking, this is not a time when we're on Zoom or Doxy or whatever to work with a client in bringing up heavy-duty stuff, trauma from the past. Um, you know, maybe some clients can do that for, but I'll, for most of my clients that have a significant amount of trauma, probably not the time to do it. Instead, I'm going to be working with clients to really anchor resources for them. So it, again, it might be external. This could be people, places, things, activities, real or imagined, um, that bring that sense of settling and comfort and calm. So it can be safe people. It might be pets. Um, places in nature can be super resourcing for people. You know, thinking about the mountains or thinking about the beach, et cetera. Um, it might be, you know, a special place. It could be music. That's very resourcing for a lot of people. Perhaps even movement, exercise, um, travel. I know uh, for me, my spiritual community is hugely resourcing right now. Even though we're meeting, uh, we're not meeting as it were. Um, so a therapist engagement can also be a very resourcing to the client. When we track well, when we are able to put into words what's happening and notice, you know, what's happening in the resonance or in the attunement with the client, that can be a hugely resourceful experience to the client. But again, a, um, resources can be internal. So when a client experiences that settling, less constriction, you know, maybe more sense of expansion or openness, spaciousness, spaciousness they might have more breath, et cetera. It, it may be um, the memory of that experience that can also be a resource. So these positive sensations in the body can help to bring calm and settling in the moment. Oops. Okay. So we kind of come toward the end here. This is again, um, you know, it's a brief, brief presentation. Um, I know that there's questions, and so we will. How's our time? We'll take a bunch of time to answer those questions. I just want to say, if this has uh, piqued your curiosity, um, you can learn more about somatic experiencing by going to traumahealing.org. Feel free to contact me. I'm always happy to talk about uh, somatic experiencing or send you resources. Um, I will say that uh, we have two trainings going on in the Chicago area right now. There is a training in the city uh, that got started a few months ago, I don't remember, or maybe the end of last year. Um, and then our suburban training was supposed to start at the beginning of this month. Everything's kind of on hold right now, and the Somatic Experiencing Training Institute is trying to figure out, you know, how we're going to move forward. Uh, there's some thought that we're going to be doing um, some things virtually, some of the training virtually, um, and we're, we're kind of working through the how-tos of that right now. So the good news for Chicago area um, people who want to, or, you know, look into this training is that we'll be doing a training this year. Uh, so, so that's the good news. And again, we'll have more information available very, very soon. Um, those are just some of the references that, that underlie uh, this presentation. And so let's go ahead and, um, uh, Margo, maybe there are questions that have arisen. Yeah, so there's a question from, let's see. Um, <clears throat> Kellen Hall, when you do these exercises, do you have 
clients answer at each step or just share at the end? Or do they just have their experience without sharing with you? Mm -hmm. um, for me, it depends on the client. Um, if I have a client who tends to dissociation, for example, I'm going to be engaged the whole time and invite their response. You know, what are you noticing, even in this moment? You know, can you describe that to me? Whatever. If a client is, you know, has more capacity in their system, I will probably just let them have that experience, you know, and just let it go unimpeded. So it's really a clinical judgment. Um, you know your client, so uh, you, can, you can tailor any of these exercises in a way that meets the needs of the client. All right. Another question from Dr. Martha Christensen. Hi, Martha. Nice to see you. Um, can you use SE with young children who may not have as much language to describe their experience? What criteria would you use to determine if SE would be appropriate for a child? You know, I'm, I'm just going to give a caveat <laughs> up front here. I, I don't work with kids. I, I did long ago and far away, long before I learned SE. Um, but there are many practitioners who do use SE with children, and they are very responsive. Um, so I know of practitioners who actually do this with babies. Often then it's more through the touch aspect of SE, which is optional, um, but uh, it can be very, very regulating to the nervous system because touch is, is direct. We're directly intervening through the nervous system, you know, through the skin, et cetera. So, um, so I would say in terms of criteria, um, there's very, very few situations that it, SE would be contraindicated. And in part, that's because SE, again, is a framework and a set of tools. So it's this way we sort of conceptualize the nervous system and what the nervous system is doing. Um, I don't think in terms of diagnosis so much anymore. I mean, yes, I can do that for insurance, et cetera. But when I think of, for example, a personality disorder, you know, like cluster B personality disorders, I'm going to be thinking in terms of, oh, that's a global high intensity activation system. And my interventions are going to be based on that, that, you know, oh, I need to work in a very, very titrated fashion because this is a very reactive nervous system. Um, it doesn't deal with variation in the nervous, in the uh, environment very well. If you remember that range of resiliency slide, it's their range of resiliency is really, really narrow. Um, so, so I have to be similarly very titrated in my interventions, just sort of just gently touching the system and encouraging the system to kind of get that flow back into it. So um, I went a little bit far afield from talking about children, but I said all that just to say this is a very, very um, moldable um, approach in that it is this framework, it is a set of tools, and it can be used with really any population, um, any age. You just adjust the tools based on you know, the client's situations. So I use SE literally with every client. I use this framework with every client. I, I will say that I do EMDR as well. I'm a trauma specialist. Um, I use EMDR with a portion of my clients. Um, when it fits the situation really well. You know, S, S, uh, EMDR can be just a wonderful tool. Um, but I'm going to use somatic experiencing and that approach with every client. The client may not know I'm using it, but it's how I'm doing the pacing of the session, um, what things I'm choosing to shift the client's attention to, um, I, you know, what my goal is in terms of supporting that person's nervous system. So that's long and roundabout answer, but... Um, but yes, you can use it with pretty much everybody. So you mentioned global high activation, and we have several other questions that I want to make sure we get to. But um, this concept of global high activation is so incredibly helpful, especially for those of us who are working with developmental trauma. Yes. Um, yes. Because these are people whose nervous systems are always in some or, or almost always in a fight, flight, or freeze state they reside there. They don't just get there. It's where they live, which is one of the ways to tell. So that might be something if we have some time to maybe touch more into. But the next yeah. question is from Jennifer. She's asking, you discussed how SE compares to CBT. 
What about integrating SE with more insight-oriented, longer-term psychodynamic psychotherapy? Yes, excellent question. One of the things I love about SE is it is applicable. You can put it on, so to speak, any other therapy that you already use. It's a, it's a bringing this other lens to your work. So for example, going back to global high intensity activation, and I think a lot of times when clients, for example, um, have developmental trauma, they may have a personality disorder, something like that. Those are the clients for whom psychodynamic work was really <laughs> developed, I think. And so when you bring that extra lens of, okay, and what is their nervous system doing? What pattern is the nervous system in? It, you, it just brings a, a whole new way of considering the client and more importantly, gives you additional tools as to how you can support that person. Um, you know, you can still use that same psychodynamic approach. Um, however, I'm going to make sure that if I'm looking for something that's in, or an intervention that's insight oriented, I'm going to make sure that my client is in their window of tolerance that they can be in a place where they can call on their cognitive um, ability to get to that insight. If they're out of their window of tolerance, I'm not going to probably be as effective. It's, they may get the insight, but it's not gonna land in their system. So, so I just think it's a really helpful, um, adjunct is probably the wrong word. I just think, it, again, it's, it's a very helpful filter um, through which to look at your client, regardless of your theoretical orientation. Great. All right. This is from Rachel. Uh, is there a list of sensations you'd like the client to have access to? I'm wondering because for me, I went to a visual image before coming to the sensation in the felt sense exercise. Yeah. Um, you know, some therapists, uh, there, there's a list of sensation words in the beginning one manual for SE. And a lot of us just photocopy that and maybe laminate it because for many clients, particularly those with early injury, you know, developmental trauma, um, often they're impaired. Um, this was a very dangerous neighborhood to be, to be walking in. So their, their system did this incredibly brilliant thing. It cut off access to it because it was too much. So part of my job is to reintroduce the client to you know, their nervous system through sensation. So I frequently will use handouts with that. And, and you know, I might say, hey, let your eyes wander over this list and let's just see if there's one or two that sort of pop out at you, you know, to describe what's happening inside. I may seed <laughs> um, their experience too with, with what I think might be happening just as a suggestion you know does it feel bubbly does it feel alive does it feel whatever so um you can actually get sensation lists off of the internet too i've found some that way so uh google is your friend hopefully that that helpful <clears throat> great this is from uh dr clark uh, i work with veterans who are incarcerated most are iraq or afghanistan vets so they have war experience trauma and have been justice involved. So their range of activities severely limited in jail. Any resources, suggestion, techniques would be most helpful? It's a big question. <laughs> um, yes, I, I think again, the beauty of, of somatic experiencing is that you can take these concepts and apply to whatever population you're working with. You know, these are people that are not going to be having um, access to a lot of movement or outside resources, but for example, developing internal resources with the client. Um, it might be doing things that don't require a ton of space. For example, if there's a fight response that maybe is getting continually triggered, you know, they're getting into fights in the, in the jail system or whatever, you know, maybe, you know, doing like a, a pushing the wall type of exercise, you know, could be really helpful. Um, or if you see them directly, we, we do pushing hands. Um, something that, again, slows the process down so the client can, can get the cues from their nervous system as to what wants to happen and 
what may be interrupting the completion of that response. So in, in SC, you know, we're, we're trained to really look for patterns. What pattern keeps happening in the client's life? Whether it is, again, a, a fight, you know, sort of thing, an anger pattern, a anxiety pattern, often those are um, uncompleted or uh, incompleted flight responses. So it's, we're looking for these patterns that maybe um, find their, their root in some of these incompleted responses. So, so it's, you're asking a really, really big question, um, but yes, there are uh, things that you can do definitely for, for any client in any situation. It's just a matter of tailoring. And Rhonda, would you agree that different nervous system states require different ner interventions? Yes. All right, because I'm seeing a lot of um, postings these days about <clears throat> for people who are stressed about COVID and are at home or, you know, there's a lot of anxiety. It may be showing up as a fight response, a flight response, or a freeze response, and everybody's being told, go meditate. But really, a, a fight response requires something like that pushing, something that right. will mobilize that energy. You know, right. flight doesn't necessarily call for go sit down and be calm. It might be envisioning yourself running, you know, really letting your system feel that. So right. Right. just, exactly. you know, there, there's the, each nervous system state, my understanding is, requires uh, its own response. So. That's exactly right. And again, that's the beauty of, of SC in terms of like, like analyzing what, what is the system doing? You know, is it a sympathetic dominant system? You know, again, that anxious sort of, you know, type of system. Is it stuck in a dorsal vagal, you know, type of collapse? Every system is going to need tailored interventions. And that's why in part this training takes so long. Um, you know, when I, I, just to share my experience, you know, when I first learned about SE, I was so excited. I, I heard about this at a um, training, uh, Bessel van der Kolk, you know, was brought out here. And I, I, he talked about somatic experiencing as well as EMDR, which I was already doing. I was so excited. It's like, I was like, that's it. That's the missing piece for me. I went home and Googled it and was so disappointed to learn it's a three-year training. It cost X amount of money, and um, and it wasn't anywhere close to where I lived at that time, and um, I, I couldn't understand why is it three years? You know, EMDR is two long weekends. You know, come on. Um, but once I took the training, I kind of understood because in some respects, I had to well, unlearn a lot of what I had learned in graduate school, um, where you know almost every theoretical orientation almost focuses on the problem. <laughs> You know, and how do we work with the problem? Um, there's some that don't, but but that's definitely how I was trained. And so, you know, I had to unlearn that. I had to really learn to slow down myself. I had to, to learn how to read my own nervous system. And then to, again, learn the tools to work with each of these different presentations of the nervous system. Because you're right, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. I think like an EMDR has kind of learned that over the years because there's all these different, you know, little riffs on the protocol <laughs> that have developed because it is not one size fits all. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> all right, this is from Kellen. If a client is pretty dissociative and numb and reports, I don't feel anything or I feel numb to these kinds of questions, do you have suggestions, and I'm sure you do, for more applicable or approachable places for them to start to get in touch with a felt sense? It's a great question. Right. Yep. And this is not a fast process. I wish it was, but for most people who are, are really numb to sensation, this started really early. So, you know, when you think about it from a standpoint of you're teaching a skill, um, you know, to a very young nervous system, think about how you would teach a young nervous system. You know, it's not like you would sit down and say, okay, come on, do whatever, and, and we're gonna have it knocked out in a week. Um, that's not how it works. It, it, it's this repetition of experience over and over again. How I like to start doing, kind of coaxing that system is by focusing on pleasant sensation, positive sensation, organized sensation. And I have them do that usually as homework in the environment by noticing something pleasant. It might be, 
okay when you're with your cat this week, you know, or your dog, you know, and you're, you're playing and you're just really enjoying that. See if you can just um, notice like a word that comes to mind, for example, because usually they're very <laughs> um, dominant in cognitively, intellectually. So notice if there's a word that comes to mind as to what this experience is like oh, you know, it's fun, or oh, it's lively, or whatever. And then um, imagine that that word is in a bubble in your head, in your brain, and then imagine that it just leaks down, you know, through your neck, and then comes down here. I don't even use the word body. Uh, it comes down here. Just, just follow it in your mind's eye. Where does it land? Where does that lively word in the bubble land? Now, I guarantee you, they will say immediately, oh, I don't know. If that's the, you know, the defense mechanism. You'll say, I know, you don't know. And so, you know, we're going to find out, you know, humor me. And, and then let's just follow it and see where it lands. Inevitably, it's where they're having some sensation. So once it lands there, I say, oh, yeah. So just notice it there, you know, is, is there anything else that's happening right there that you can, you can notice? Oh, it feels kind of open, you know, or it feels loose or whatever. Doesn't matter what it is. We're just building that connection bit by bit by bit. And so I do that with positive sensation or positive experience. And uh, the homework piece is, is really experiencing it in the body, not just thinking it. Because again, we're, we're working with these, these bottom and middle parts of the brain, which are all about sensation. They can't think their way out of things. So hopefully that answers the question. That's great. <clears throat> All right, this is from Kate. Is there a reference, articles, publications, et cetera, for the review of the effectiveness of clinical applications backslash trials of SE? You mentioned there go, were studies. Yeah, I would go to the SE website. Again, that's traumahealing.org. And um, I think there's, there's a tab where you can get to that, that listing. Great. Uh, I think we sort of covered this. Do you have a recommendation for a client who isn't able to feel anything? That's the freeze state, right? I mean, when we talk about fight, flight, or freeze, mm -hmm. and sometimes that language is really helpful for people, I have mm -hmm. found. Do you agree with that? Yes. And um, I'm looking to, in that freeze state, you know, sometimes it's, it's conflicting impulses. You know, it is a wonderful um, uh, story in Peter's book or that describes this, one of his books where uh, a first responder, I think it's a firefighter, comes to an accident site and they're trained to, of course, go, go to the accident and to reach in and turn the car off, you know? And so he goes to do that, but he sees this horribly mangled teenage girl driver. And so there's a horror that, you know, again, this reach in at the same time wanted to come back and run. So these conflicting impulses resulted in a freeze. So what I typically do in situations like this is I, I look to separate those and to feel one at a time if it is truly a, a, a conflicting impulses situation. If it is just kind of a, a, a freeze that's not from that, I look for movement, you know. So client, as, as you, you know, are thinking about whatever and, um, you know, we notice that immobility that, that often happens. Let's just scan your body really slow. And where do you feel the least amount of freeze? You know, something that's maybe just a little less. And I might say, it, you know, is it in your toes? It is, is it in your fingertips? You know, again, seeding it a little bit as to where it might be. And they say, yes. And I say, okay, so what's the sensation there that's telling you that, that's a little less freezy. Often they'll say, well, I can move my toes. I can move my fingers. Fabulous. Would it be okay to just take a little time and just feel that and allow that movement to happen? So I do it with them. I mirror that. And often that starts to unthaw that freeze. Now, I, I, I go gently and I don't expect big change because there's a reason this freeze has happened. So we're just um, nudging the system a little bit at a time. Titration is the, the SE word for that. Just, you know, allowing for it the smallest, most digestible part, you know, to, to be done at a time so that we build capacity to restore, uh, you know, fullness and goodness. 
I just pray I answered that. Wonderful. Um, okay, this is from Pamela. How can you tell if someone is in or outside of their window of tolerance? Excellent question. And that reminds me of, I think it was Barbara's question from in the presentation. So if you remember that window of tolerance, that range of resiliency, someone is out of it, you know, one way or the other, when they are not able to function in a, in a great way. For example, clients that are in anxiety or panic are kind of above that and it's getting in the way of them being present and taking in information, being able to learn, um, being able to respond appropriately to, to stimulation in the environment. You know, if you think of your anxious client, for example, or better yet, a panicked client, they are so far out of their window of tolerance that you know you can barely get to them because they're so focused on whatever the uh, fear-producing thing is. Um, so they're not able to stay present, take in information, learn, function well. The other side of that kind of, I think of it as below the window of tolerance, is the client that's in that collapse. You know, that the level of depression is so significant, they can't get out of bed, et cetera, et cetera. You know, they are, they are not in their window of tolerance. You know, I can, I can stand on my head and do everything, but, but that's not going to probably uh, land with, with that client who's in that collapse. So, um, so again, they're not present, they're not able to take in information, they're not able to learn. Um, I think it's Bessel van der Kolk that talks about they don't have curiosity. You know, curiosity is gone if a person is out of their window of tolerance or range of resiliency. So those are some, some guidelines. Um, I think there's some physiological signs of that as well, but, but those would be kind of the function things that would suggest that a person is out of their window of tolerance. And uh, one thing I wanted to mention was, so in SE terms, we would think of, again, from a nervous system perspective, anxiety is out of the window of tolerance and sort of stuck. The sympathetic system is stuck in the on position. And then depression, something like that, is you know, out of the window of tolerance in the other direction and stuck in that, that off position. The, the, the system is not, again, activating and deactivating like it's supposed to, there's stuckness there. So SE is about helping to, again, just very gently bring movement and that flow back into the system so that it's, it's activating and deactivating like it's supposed to. Excellent. All right, this is from Hannah. Uh, is there any research connection made with dance movement therapy? There's quite a bit of overlap with the somatic approaches, as you pointed out. So I was also curious if there's an alternate route path for training for those with a somatic background, or yes. if it's solely the three-year training. Um, hmm. Well, as far as I know, there's just the three-year training. I, I haven't heard of anything else. <laughs> However, um, people that do come to the training with other backgrounds, for example, dance movement therapy, something like that, um, are way ahead of the game. Um, we have a dance movement therapist on our, our staff, so I know there's a tremendous amount of overlap. I haven't, I haven't heard of anyone, you know, kind of getting credit, as, as it were. I, that's maybe a possibility. I would always encourage people to talk with the uh, Somatic Experiencing Training Institute and see. Good question. Um, but again, there's, you know, I love somatic experiencing and it is not the only way to, to work with trauma. I will say that the, the research is, is mounting that a somatic approach, be it SE, dance movement therapy, yoga therapy, um, are going to be much more effective uh, than, you know, kind of uh, cognitive approaches, standalone cognitive approaches. So, so I, I hope I answered the question a little bit. Um, I hear what you're saying. Um, I just don't know the answer. And before we get our box filled up with uh, people who are saying, wait a minute, but CBT and yeah. analysis and you know, dynamic therapies, it, it, this can be woven in. It's not, it doesn't have to be exclusive, but including the somatic piece is really, the, that's where the research is landing, is saying, yes. boy, making sure that is somehow woven into your treatment is critical. That's right. All right. This is from Kate. 
Um, so it seems that using SE principles, the goal of the therapy is to figure out what was the client's personal survival protocol prior to the time of trauma. How was it interrupted? And then coaching them on completing the natural self-directed survival protocol. I, I think that's actually a pretty good summation. Yeah, not bad. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, yeah. Um, so from Ari Groner, uh, with SC, it seems that body awareness is so important. Uh, and Ari works with a lot of folks who have gender dysphoria. So how do you suggest working with clients that experience dysphoria and actively spend a lot of their time ignoring their body? Right. And, and doesn't it make sense when there's been so much trauma about that, you know, societally, et cetera. So, you know, um, I, I always joke that when I'm talking to SE students and doing consultation with them, that when in doubt, slow it down. <laughs> That's going to probably be the best rule of thumb. Um, to slow it down and make it safe enough to explore whatever's there. Um, there's, again, SE is only limited by uh, a practitioner's creativity. So, um, Again, back to that principle of titration, I'm going to, you know, for a client that's, that's it's, say, highly activated by the thought of, of slowing down and, and being in the body, I might say, so let's imagine that, um, you know, we can see you on a screen, you know, far away, as far away as you'd like, and it's black and white. And, and you are here with me, and we've got the, you've got the, magical remote control of life. It controls the space-time continuum. So you can speed up or slow down or do whatever you need to do. Pause. But let's just play that, you know, what's happening on the screen in super, super slow motion, kind of like they do in football to see, you know, did it cross the goal line or not. So super slow motion. And let's just notice what happens, you know, a moment at a time, for example. So that's an example of titration. Like, moving things far enough away, um, metaphorically, to give the client more control so that they can take in the information that the body has, is giving them in a way that is manageable. Um, you know, given their psychological structure, um, you know, the trauma that they've had, et cetera. So there's, again, a ton of ways that you can do that, but the, the key is, again, slowing it way, way down so that it is doable for the client. Excellent. All right, one last comment, and then we're going to need to stop and let people take their assessment before we end today. But Jeanette Dingy, who is one of the best trauma therapists I know, next mm -hmm. to you, um, she says, Craig Penner does somatic EMDR classes for those who do EMDR. It has four levels. And she also had an answer to the previous question about dance movement therapy and other applications about um, somatic experiencing. Oh, she was just commenting on that part. So yeah, Craig Penner's work sounds like it's excellent. So yes. Rhonda, I can't thank you enough for doing this today. This is excellent. Uh, you know, all applaud. This is great. Uh, really, I'm telling you this, this training, if you can do it, please do it. It has, you know, I always considered myself a very psychodynamic therapist. Like you, I feel, Rhonda, like I use this just about in every session um, that I do with people these days. So thank you. Again, you can reach Rhonda uh, at lifecare-wellness, wait, life-care-wellness.com. And we'll make sure that's available on our website too. It's in her bio that all of you received. So thank mm -hmm. you so much, everybody. This was wonderful. 